Welcome back to the Attack the Rack podcast. Thank you for joining us today. Um, I am sure you have probably heard of the great Richie Jordan from Fenville, Michigan, in West, uh, in West Michigan. Incredible high school athlete, starred in football, basketball, baseball, and track. If you have not heard about him, you're going to really enjoy this today as well as you learn about him. Uh, Richie Jordan was a uh, first team All American athlete, class of 1965. Also, a first, uh, first team All American that season was the great Lou Al Cinder, also known as Kareem Abdul Jabbar. So he was on the first team, uh, first team All American 1965 team with Lou Al Cinder. Richie Jordan is one of the greatest athletes the state of Michigan has ever seen. In fact, in 2001, he was inducted into the National uh, High School Athletic Hall of Fame. At that time, in 2001, he was the only athlete from Michigan to have that honor. I believe there's been a handful of people since then, but he was the first and the only uh, in 2001. Jordan is mostly known for what he did on the basketball court, although he did in addition to playing basketball at Michigan State for a little bit, he also played some football and some baseball. But again, he is most known for what he did on the basketball floor. His senior season, he averaged 44 points a game. Keep in mind, this is before the three-point line. Uh, and that 44 points per game average is still the MHSAA record to this day. Today, we have an incredible story from Glenn Banco. Glenn Banco was a 1965 graduate from Bridgman High School uh, in southwest Michigan. He, him and his team played against Richie Jordan and the Fenville Blackhawks in the 1965 regional semifinals. It was an incredible game. Richie poured in 60 points. Uh, Glenn is going to tell us all about that game, and also he's going to share with us a lot more about the legend of Richie Jordan. All right, enjoy the program. Welcome to the Attack the Rack podcast. I am your host, Kurt Van Hecken, and you are tuning in to the number one rated podcast on the planet based on the people that rated it number one. The Attack the Rack podcast is brought to you by Get to Two Media. The weather is going to be getting a lot nicer across the country in the next few weeks. And you know what that means? Golf season. Have you ever had the desire to go out and play a round of golf, but couldn't because you didn't have golf clubs? Well, I need to thank the sponsor of the program today, Golf Clubs. If you are unable to play that round of golf because you don't have golf clubs, you need golf clubs. All right, so we have today a special guest. Uh, his name is Glenn Banco. Glenn played against the great Richie Jordan uh, back in the 60s. Uh, Richie Jordan is a well-known basketball legend uh, here in, in, in West Michigan. But as we'll get into today, he was a lot more than just a basketball player. Glenn is also the father of a previous guest we've had on the program, uh, Mike Benko. Uh, that was a ton of fun for me and brought back a lot of good memories talking to Mike. What, uh, what were, I know you said you listened to that one. What were you, what was going through your head as you were listening to, to your son's story? Well, I was reliving a lot of those, uh, those stories and those moments that we went through because uh, his mother and I have followed him and supported him through the whole journey. So the things he was talking about and the stories he was telling you about, we, we lived all of those. Yeah. And it was, it was uh, quite refreshing, and it was kind of nice to listen to that. I enjoyed that. Yeah. Uh, the trip I was on with Mike to uh, UMass ended with you picking us up at the airport. <laughs> and uh, I'll never forget, we, we, uh, one of the, the, the very first time I ever had a Krispy Kreme donut, we stopped over on East Beltline. Uh, in 28th Street, there's a Krispy Kreme there, and uh, we went to the drive-through on it after we picked us up at the airport. 
on our way back. So, um, all right. So we're, you know, uh, what we're really going to talk a lot about today is um, your senior season uh, playing high school basketball. You played at a school in Southwest Michigan called Bridgman, um, and you, uh, your senior year in the regional finals, you guys played against the Fenville Blackhawks and the great Richie Jordan. So we're gonna we're gonna get into that here uh, in a, in a little bit. Um, obviously, the focus for this is is more so basketball. But did you grow up playing any other sports? Yeah, I, I had been playing sports since I was about four years old. I, mean, I was born in Chicago. Okay. And uh, I'd get a rubber ball and a glove, and I'd go in the alley and bounce the ball off the alley door and field grounders, just like I was Melly Fox of the White Sox. And I, <laughs> I did that constantly. When we moved to Michigan, when I was five or six, uh, joined Little League, of course. There was a program. They just got started in Little League in our small town. Dad was the coach, as usual. Played Little League, Pony League, Legion Ball, all baseball. Yep. Never played basketball um, until I was in grammar school, seventh grade, maybe. First time I ever touched, I mean, really played, played basketball. But, uh, yeah, sports has been part of my life, my entire life. Sure. Uh, did you, what did you do after high school? Did you go, did you play any, any sports in college? I got, believe it or not, I, I had several offers. Okay. I even had an offer from, Western. Okay. Uh, An MIA school sent me a letter. MIAA school. Um, Yeah, I had five or six offers, but it was Vietnam time. Okay. One of the first things you did when you graduated high school is go to the draft board and register for the draft. In other words, here's my name. Come and get me when you want me. Um, So there's a lot of uncertainty. And to be honest with you, I never thought about playing at the next level after high school. Back then, I mean, back then, coaches didn't market their players and send a CD to all the schools in the country. And look at this guy, you know, promoting yep. him, which yep. is nice. Yep. There was no such thing. Right. So I never really, really thought about playing. So when I went to I went to Western eventually and I'll be darned, I was playing a pickup game, which I spent a lot of time in the field house. At Western. <laughs> I went to class once in a while, but it was mostly <laughs> and the freshman coach was walking through the auxiliary gym where I was playing. And he said, are you Benko from Bridgman? Yeah. He said, why don't you come up? Here's my, my office is real, blah, blah, blah. Come and see me this afternoon. We can work something out. Really? Well, lo and behold, in my last game as a senior in the quarterfinals at Western, he sat behind our bench. It was my best game of my career, like 15 for 17 from the field. Wow. I've never done that before or after. He remembered that. So now we're a couple of years down the road, and he actually remembered that. So that's the reason why. I went to his office, and he wasn't there at the time. And I sat there, and I got nervous and said, you know, what if I, if they offer me something and I don't make it? And this is a D1 school here. I'm <laughs> from a town of 1,500 people. What if I get cut? I can't, I, you know, what am I going to – and I talked myself out of it, and he didn't – he was late, and he never showed yeah. up one time. I got up and – Left. Did you really? So I went to practices in the field house, and I would sit way up so he didn't see me. And I watched what what that team looked like. And you've got the six nine guys and the point guards that are off the charts. And holy cow! And I said, "Well, I'm glad. You know, I'm glad he didn't." Then I went a week later after cuts. You know what they saved? Who they kept on the team? The six five coachable players. Like me, the coachable guys. Yeah. The dash and the flash was nice, but we want somebody who's fundamentally sound. And I thought, well, there you go. I could have done it, maybe, maybe. And I'll never know. Yeah. Um, you know, and and when you're when you're talking about that, there's a couple of things you said that stood out. Number one, the coach being at your game. You probably didn't even know he was there. So what a great lesson there for you know current athletes. You never know who's watching. You never know. There could be a coach there to watch an opponent of yours, and you may play well that game, and now maybe you're on. on no, that's radar. true. That's true. Um, so, and then the other thing, be coachable. You know, college coaches, they want kids that are coachable, 
they when they go to games to watch you play, they're not necessarily always watching your 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 skills on the court or whatever sport you're playing. They're also looking at how you interact with your teammates, how you interact with your coach. Huge stuff. So, well, yeah, two two pretty. No, I, I agree. Yeah. I agree. Your demeanor is part of the package. Yes, your body and, language. And when I took the court on every game, I said, "There's a whole bunch of people watching me, and I'm going to do my best, and I'm not going to be a jerk, and I'm going to play hard, and we'll see how it all turns out." So I always tried to do that. So yeah. maybe that paid off with the rest. Of oh, the I, yeah, absolutely. Um, and okay, so you didn't end up playing, you know, playing, um, any organized after, after high school. Um, did you get into, involved with like rec leagues? I know I, you're a big softball, right? So I played, softball. I played in rec leagues for after college, oh, 10, 12 years. Okay. And, uh, there was a, a league called the Blossom Land League in Benton Harbor, St. Joe. Okay. And it was a mixture of college players, former college players, a lot of studs, um, local legends from high school, a lot of the Benton Harbor aces, I mean, good players, the likes, you know, Chet Walker with the Bulls, that type, um, L.C. Bowen, who was led at Benton Harbor to the Class A championship, I mean, it was very competitive. I was with a group of guys that were like me, and we, we actually won that league one year. Wow. Um, it was my version of going to college and playing. Sure. Uh, uh, a company like Whirlpool would put a 67666, six, 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 you know, these are guys from all over the country that worked at Whirlpool, played college ball. It was very competitive. And we, I, won a, I was on a team that won a Parks and Rec state title okay. uh, at, at Central with, with that same kind of group of guys. Sure. So I, I got my fill. I, I said, well, there you are. There's, there's my... There's my college <laughs> stuff, you know, so I didn't, anyway, that's, uh, I played softball for years. Um, I was on a travel team for two years, select travel team. We traveled around kind of the Midwest. Uh, we won two back-to-back -back Class A, ASA state titles, back-to-back. -back. Wow. Um, pretty good reputation as a team. We played all the best teams in a, in a two or three state area. It was pretty sure. nice. Good experience. Uh, but the key to all this is I always was surrounded by really good teammates. Yeah. Really good. That's a also, really important. That's also what makes it enjoyable. Yep. No uh, egos. Right. No, I'm better than you. Yeah. I mean, it, that's what made it work. So. Um, and then you've also done some coaching. I coached at uh, Allen Christian Baseball, Baseball for six years. My, okay. God, my God hired me. Okay. And I was like a JV and sometimes varsity assistant, depending on what his need was. Um, then I went to Zeeland West and was an assistant coach there for two years. Um, and I had a little stint with Holland, actually. Okay. Uh, they were struggling with their JV coaching staff, and I was okay. asked, do you want to you wanna come in here and help us a sure. little bit? And I did for part of the season. So, nice. Um, all right, so we're going to talk about the great Richie Jordan today. And I've been looking to, uh, forward to hearing your story uh, for, for quite a while. Um, you know, hearing your perspective from someone who played against him. Right. Uh, and this is also pretty cool for me because I remember hearing about the great Richie Jordan when I was growing up in the 80s and 90s. My mom went to rival – or so Richie Jordan played for Fenville High School. My mom went to rival Saugatuck High School. She was a few years younger but definitely went to the games, saw Richie play. And, um, you know, when I, she would always talk about this guy, Richie Jordan. And, um, and then our, our local newspaper growing up here in, in, in Holland, the Holland Sentinel, had a, had a, a sports writer by the name of Leo Martinosi. And I swear, it, it, again, as I'm growing up in the 80s and 90s, at least once a year, he would write an article about Richie Jordan. So, Again, another you know connection with 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 Richie, and um, then <laughs> I ended up coaching JV basketball at Fenville as well. And uh, uh, while well, I'm there, of course, I'm always hearing about Richie Jordan. Um, but you know, one thing about that too is I made a lot of really great connections with with the Fenville community. I have a lot of great friends from Fenville, and I'm sure they're gonna enjoy mm -hmm. hearing. 
mm-hmm. hearing this this um this today. Um so before we get into your game against Richie Jordan in your senior season, let's first talk a little bit about your season leading up to this game. Um, and, and you guys played in the regional final. It was a regional semi. Regional semi final. Yeah. Like you play, okay, regional semi final. Um, going into that season, though, was there a lot of hype around your team? No, we, we came off. Uh, we came off about a twelve and six season. We lost a couple senior guards. We were maybe third in the league. It was called the Big Eight. Um, mostly C schools, a couple Ds and a B. A very competitive league. Every uh, most teams had a little bit of size. Um, there's not. There wasn't much disparity between num- the you know the top team and the third or fourth team. They could, they could knock each other off pretty easy. Um, we came into the season. There was no hype except um, myself and the other. Uh, forward we played I was a wing guy both of us um, we were starters as juniors so the coach inherited us um, and then we had a, a junior center was just under six five was an exceptional jumper exceptional um, so the front line was pretty nice so even in his write-up at the, before the season started saying if I can find some guards we might be able to do make some damage there was a team in our league named Galeen, a little little town just uh, north of the Indiana line, cl- perennial class D competitor. They had a 6'10 center who went to Indiana. I played against him as a junior. Um, always won the conference for years. Hadn't lost a conference game in three years. <clears throat> Big front line. You know, that, that yeah. they got the hype, and that's fine. Okay. So we... So we didn't come into the season like, oh, boy, look out. Not at all. It was, I'm looking for guards. We're a little bit slow afoot. Maybe you know, my, our coach was always like that, very conservative, didn't push any of his players' names or like, oh, yeah, but watch for this guy. He never did that as a team. No one was better than anyone else. We were all equal, That's and that's how he treated us. Um, so for the season, do you want to know just really quickly how, how that went? Yeah, yeah. yeah. I mean, I, I did a little bit of research. I saw you guys actually did lose your first game of the season, and then you ended up losing two of your first we, six. We, we, we lost our first game uh, to St. Joe Catholic. Okay. And it wasn't even close. In retrospect, I look at the scorebook. The coach, coach used a whole bunch of guys. And what he was trying to do was to – get the right combination, and he was going to use this non-conference game to figure that out. Well, it didn't work because there was no rhythm because guys were coming in and out. I mean, I played the whole game, but our, our backcourt was, all, you know, when you got to get a rhythm and you got to have guys you trust and know, and we didn't, so we lost. But then we won four conference games in a row, so we're 4-0 and in the conference. But then our sixth game, we get beat by a Class B school, uh, Bering Springs, yep, a good team, sure. had some nice players. Shouldn't have lost, of course. I always say that, but we shouldn't have. And it was because we were still searching for that last guard, that last playmaker that could help us. In that game, the coach inserted this particular person as a replacement, and things went okay. We still lost, but it calmed it down. We went okay, maybe this is what we're looking for. We, we, we got to have a guard that can bring it down not turn it over, beat the press, and he turned out to be the guy. So what happened? We won 11 in a row with that lineup. Yep. Coach kept it intact the entire season, and we had a little substitution rotation of a sixth man, and maybe we'd go seven on occasion, and that stayed intact. Yep. Ultimately, we went 15-2 and to end the season. We beat that team I told you about, the perennial champs, twice. At their place in ours, first two losses in three years. We averaged 80 a game. Winning winning margin of victory was 19 points. Wow. Uh, out, <laughs> rebounding wise, we uh, only were out rebounded twice um, in uh, the entire season. It was, and this is the 1964 65 season. 64 65. So when you're talking about averaging 80 points a game there's no three-point line there's no three-point line and that's the thing in all of this discussion that if you throw that into the mix it's 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 hard to tell what those numbers would have looked right at. yeah 
Right. Um, so also one thing I, I, I saw when I was doing a little research is you guys for that season had just gotten bumped up from class D we were to class the, yeah. C, correct? We were the first time in school history. I mean, as a towns of 1,500 people, maybe on a good day, a couple people more, but small town. So it was always a class D school. But in basketball, back in the 30s and 40s and 50s, they, I think Bridgman has the most Class D state championships, but okay. it was way back when. Sure. Well, we went about five students over my senior year. We're bumped to C. So we're the first team in school history to play in C. Big deal or not, I don't know. But, you know, for us, yeah, hey, we're moving up here. Right. It's going to be a little more competitive. So, yeah, you're right. That's uh, so, so you guys end the season, obviously, conference champs. You go undefeated in league we went, play. We went, we went 12-0 and 0 in the conference. Yep. Um, our reputation was defense, especially around the basket. Um, they run. They rebound and they run. I mean, a rebounding guy. We had the two best rebounders in the conference, and if you threw me in the mix, we can maybe say almost three. Okay. These guys averaged, and this is no exaggeration, a double double the entire season. Wow. Double figure scoring and yep. easily. I mean, they would get 15, 18 rebounds a game. So you could dominate them. And then it triggered the running game yeah. and off we went. Yeah. And that was our reputation. Um, and so l- let me ask you this. You know, and, and, and I'm very familiar with, you know, high school basketball now, you know, and, and as a player back in the late 90s myself, uh, we. You know, we did a lot of stuff year round, mm-hmm. um, and, and and to this day, there's a lot of uh, year round stuff. There's workouts in the fall. There's workouts in the spring. The whole month of June, you're doing basketball now, whether it's uh, camp, uh, continuing just doing workouts, or in, in June, teams are going and they're going to these team camps and they're scrimmaging. A lot of them are playing uh, upwards of 20 games mm-hmm. in the month of June. So it's really um, a year-round thing, and I think that's how it is for um, for a lot of sports. Was it? What was it like back then? Or was it was. It, just... it was totally. It was totally different. There was no such thing as AAU ball. Okay. There might have been on a national basis. Sure. That was at the college level, but the high school level didn't exist. Definitely not even a thought about a travel team, and no one would even know what that was. One of the reasons why the the, the towns. We're separated by several miles. You know, you get 15 miles or it, and it was uh, the uh, fruit belt, farm area, a lot of oak. So there were farmers, kids that worked for their dads in the off season to help, you know. Um, there were no resources for transportation. Sure. More than that, there was no one that could organize a team based on all these locations and pull it together. Um, and where do you play? And, and, these are small towns with limited resources. The school wasn't going to say, we'll support your AAU efforts. You know, right. It wasn't going to work that way. And more than that, most there was a core of guys in a small school usually play all the sports. Jordan would be an example. When, it was, when basketball was, time was over, he put his shoes away and got his glove out. When that was over, he went and jumped, high jumped, you know, and then put his pole or jump yeah. thing stuff away and went and played football. Right. Then turned his pads in for his Chuck Taylor All Stars, um, and that's how that worked. To throw a travel thing, so you're going to play in all of June would be like what? Okay. We had camps and clinics, but the camps were part recreation and part hoops. We went to one camp when I was entering my senior year. Prior to that, about four of us went to Angola, Indiana, to Branch McCracken, was the a legendary Indiana coach before Bobby Knight. Okay. So they sponsored a camp all summer, and it was staffed by play, Indiana players in McCracken. Um, not much hands-on. There's like 150 kids and like 20 staff members. So basically it was scrimmaging and, oh, here's a few things you want to work on, but nothing personal. You went, you spent half a day playing ball because it was so hot out. The courts were outside, you know, by two in the afternoon, that was over. So you went swimming and stuff. So it was like, okay. Yeah. You know, and you walk away going, did it make me better? Did I learn anything? Not really. Okay. Uh, But when we got back, the coach said, listen, I'm going to open the gym for you guys. I can't be there by rule, 
but I can tell the janitor to unlock the door, and here's what you might want to think about sure. working on. Sure. We did that for a few weeks, but again, it was hard to get guys because everybody worked. It was the off season. Yeah. We put all our sports stuff away. Now it's time to work at your job or you know work on your car, whatever it was. Uh, so that kind of worked a little bit, but you know it didn't make you better. Right. I've always been under the impression that kids should play as many sports as they can. Hand your glove in for your for your pads and, uh, and see what that's about. And and you'll find your niche. If you're a good enough player, I always thought, you don't need to market yourself in an AAU or a travel team. I, I've always felt that way. It isn't going to necessarily make you better. Um, if you're good enough, they'll come to you, especially in these days yeah. of social media and the way the news gets around. So that's that yeah. was my opinion, right or wrong. But. So, uh, no, spot on. And, and you know, for, for whatever reason, uh, a common theme of, of the podcast when I've had other coaches on is we, we naturally just get to the to the conversation about three sport athletes or, or two sport mm-hmm. athletes and how, how different it is now mm-hmm. where a lot of kids will give up their second, third sport to focus on the one sport where they're hoping that that will then get them the college scholarship. That's, and, the and the key is the hoping part. Right. There are absolutely no guarantees. And what are the odds that you're going to actually right. attain what you're after here? Yep. They're pretty slim most of the time. So, uh, No, 100%. And you hit the nail on the head. If you're good enough, they're going to find you. And um, now, if, if the only sport you like is just basketball, then, then sure. But I just, I, I, I struggle with a kid who, who maybe loves baseball you know, giving up something he loves to, to play AAU in the spring instead of playing baseball because the, the, the uh, it's not even really a thought. It's almost an assumption with a lot of people that is if you do that, it's going to translate into right, a college right, scholarship. Right, right. And you got to wonder uh, who's, is it for the parents' benefit? Who, who's right. benefiting from this? Right. Um, it, it costs a lot to be on a travel team. It takes a lot of time. Um, at Holland Christian, we had uh, when I was coaching baseball, we uh, Vanderslice is his name, and he went yeah. on to either what cornerstone. Cornerstone, yes. Um, yeah. Yeah. He was a, he played football and baseball, and during the baseball season, I said, you know, we got practice, you know, we got to be there, you know, right after school. Well, I can't. I got to go play basketball. And I said, listen, we're, we're baseball scene. You understand that? Why are you go? Well, I got to because I'm on the, you know. And and he actually gave up baseball eventually. Yeah. He, was a, he was a pretty good player sure. to play basketball. Yep. Now, did that help him ultimately? Probably not, because he was nudging six nine by the time he went to Cornerstone. So those right. coaches will make you a good player. You don't need to prove oh, right. anything more. Yeah, and 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 also I think athletes today, speaking specifically of basketball, is they they rely on AAU thinking that that's what's going to get them better. You know, in an AAU season. You're you're practicing twice a week. Um, you're playing, you know, six to eight weekend tournaments. So, you know, if you love basketball, that's your passion, and and you want to get better. I'm not saying don't play AU because certainly playing the game, you're getting better. Right. But you need to find a balance between going to these weekend tournaments and playing five games, and also working on your your skills, your ball handling, your shooting. Because as, as I've mentioned and we've talked about a few times on the podcast, you know, you go to a, um, you know, you go to a weekend AAU tournament, play five games. You're probably getting up maybe 30, 40 shots in those five games. But what if on Saturday morning you just went to the gym? How many shots can you get I, up in an hour? I agree. And, and so, you know, again, and there's a lot of good AAU programs out there, a lot of good AAU coaches that, ha- that do have the kids uh, best interest in mind and um, run some really good practices and some some skill development uh, in those practices but you can't just rely on on playing a you you've got to spend a lot of time in the gym mm-hmm. working on your skills if if playing at the next level is uh, is what you want to do so <laughs> if you're a single sport guy and that's your passion then go at it but there's also the the mental and physical burnout that comes with that um, Sometimes it's better to get away from your sport for a while, or you know, 
reset everything and then go back to it. But no, I agree. I agree with what you're saying. Um, so, all right. So now let's let's move back ahead here. Um, you guys end the regular season undefeated, conference champs. Now is there some hype going into the state tournament well, for you guys? Here's a story. There, um, we sweep through the conference, twelve and zero. We've won. By the time we hit the districts, we had won eleven in a row. Ultimately, the whole string lasted sixteen in a row. We didn't lose a game in three months. We, we, we lost a game mid December, and the next time we lost was the quarters, which was the last week of March. So we went three months without a loss. Uh, so there was a bit of anticipation. We ended up with three first team all conference players on the front line. All three yep. of us were all conference. One of our guards was honorable mention, the sophomore. And the other guard, our point guy, our playmaker, was definitely all conference material, but I don't know if the conference wanted to have five guys sure, from the same sure. team. Yeah, no, yeah. really. Yeah. I truly believe that because he, he deserved it. I can it. see that. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So we went into <laughs> the districts. Um, I guess we would be called the favorite. Okay. The districts were in Niles, all big eight teams. So these are all conference teams. In our, and you know from coaching, and anybody that's been around the high school game, playing the same team three times is a recipe for an upset. It is. And that's how we approached it. What, but we never, we never thought, well, what are they going to do? How's this going? We just played. Oh, we're playing Three Oaks was the first team. They had good size, nice team. Um, we didn't say, oh, 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 you know, we just, yeah, we'll play. We'll see how that works out. We won the first game. We pulled away. We won by 17 in the open. Okay. Okay. Um, played our usual game, defense, rebound, run, find the open man. Because we had, we had four starters that averaged double figures. And there's not a big disparity between the top score and the scoring was really always really pretty close. So you couldn't key on us, you know. You couldn't double a guy because if you did, yep, they're going to burn. We'll, we'll, we'll take care of that for you. So that was our reputation. We ended up playing one of the lower tier teams for the final, and we figured, what are, you know, we did say, I wonder what they're going to try. Well, they uh, slowed it down. There was no clock. There was no penalty for just standing yeah. there, and they just worked the perimeter, sure. looking for a shot. And they figured, if we don't give you the ball, you can't run on us, and rightly so. But the other side of that is you sure the heck better make your shots because if you don't, you're going to be in trouble. They packed in the defense because our front line had got a reputation as a, a pretty formidable. They can dominate a game. And it, and it was true. Um, so they packed in the defense so we couldn't, couldn't move through the lane. I was getting doubled half the time. And, but it, it, it held up. Their, their approach held up until the third quarter. Went, we outscored them twenty to ten, and then pulled away. Only won by eight, but okay. it wasn't sure. necessarily that close. Right. So we walk away, very businesslike, not spectacular. Beat the two teams for the third time. So we said, I think we can play in a slowdown game because we were used to running. We right. would break games open with our running game, but we couldn't do it in either of those. But so we were patient, and uh, so we went into the regional. And again, because the media, there was no, there, there, you didn't, you just knew by reading in the paper that you, you were going to Battle Creek for the regional, Matawan, Constantine, Pittsford, Fenville, and Bridgman. That's all you knew. Yep. Didn't know beans about any, any of the teams except one, Fenville. Well, and, okay, so, so let me, let me just pause you there. That, that was another thing I wanted to ask you about back then. How much scouting and prep would you do for your opponents? Because in this day and age, uh, coaches get film on their opponent multiple games, right? Put together these elaborate scouting reports, these ulti- you know, these elaborate game right. plans. What was that aspect of the game like back then? There, there, there was little uh, trading of information. A lot of coaches. Well, do you have any information you can give me about so and so team? Well, no, you know, they, they were hesitant to share. It, it was, it was kind of odd. You would think you'd want to help your fellow coaches, but there was not much of that in, in the way of prep. No, we never, except for Fenville, we never said, here's what we're going to do against them. Okay. We never did that. Okay. We were, we were uh, a low key team that just played and we knew 
that if we just played our game, we were going to be competitive. We never worried about the up and coming opponent we just played. And we had success with it. It was a nice mix of guys who didn't have any egos. We shared the ball. Um, but for Fenville, the Herald Press was, is a St. Joe Herald Press, St. Joe paper, and then there's one in Benton Harbor. They used to cover the, um, a three county area in their sports reporting along the lake. Berrien County, which is the bottom county in, uh, along the lake, Van Buren, that's South Haven, yep. all the way up to Allegan, which incidentally includes Benville. So you open the paper up, and that was our only means of what's going on. Who's this Jordan guy? He just put up 49 against Hackett. And they'd have a picture of him and go, oh, holy crap. And he had a running mate who was all state too. It was, you know, he was averaging 23. So, okay, that's good. Every, you know, every Saturday you'd look at this guy's putting up numbers. At the same time, they used to publish the top 20 scorers in that three county area. The av your average. And at the top, there's, you know, L.C. Bowen, Al Brenner from uh, Niles. He played football at Michigan State. I mean, it was a who's who of, yeah. I mean, these uh, L.C. Bowen went to Bradley and ended up getting uh, drafted by the Sonics when they played in Seattle. This was some, some tough guys. I was able to stay on that list about in the middle, which okay. was a, a big deal for me. Yeah. That was my – but there's this guy at the top, Jordan, Fenville. He started out in the 30s. Then a week later, his average is like 35. Then a week later, it's 38. You know, and then about four games into the season, he's, he's nudging 40. And it stayed that way. And it climbed after yeah. that and started getting closer to 40, 44. And he separated himself. So going into the regional, all we knew about Fenville was him. Yep. Okay. And the articles we read. Sure. And they were always complimentary about him and his running mate. But they had a nice team. They averaged 90 a game. Wow. And when you think about it, 44, that was coming from one guy. Right. But still, they had some nice players. They had another All-State guy who was averaging 23. So that's all we knew. Yep. We didn't know anything about the other opponents at all. Um, but again, no scouting, no prep. We'll get to what the strategy when you're yeah. ready to hear. No, what no, I, I am. And, and, and it, you know, this time of year is really special, uh, in the state of Michigan or, or all across the country because of March Madness. You know, usually when you think of March Madness, obviously you're thinking about the, the Division One tournament, but it's also trickles down into high school. And this time of year, uh, as we're having this conversation, district championships are going to be held uh, tomorrow night all over the state of Michigan. And that's why I wanted to do this episode now mm -hmm. because of obviously the connection with the high, the high school basketball. And speaking of districts, you guys, met, uh, you guys ran through the districts and then you get to the first game of regionals. Well, first of all, when we hit, the regionals, we uh, the first uh, Fendel had a bye. Okay, now, yeah, so I was gonna say, I thought you mentioned five yeah, teams. Yeah, Fendel had a bye. Okay, and incidentally, Richie put up 46 in their district um, final. Okay, so he didn't disappoint anybody. His running mate had 33. Wow, so they didn't skip a beat. So now you're reading articles and say, uh, Fenville's poised to win it all. No reason to doubt it, no reason to doubt it. Um, so we knew that was in the mix, but again, we didn't go, oh, we got all nervous. We never, I, I'll be honest with you, never thought a thing about it. Okay. It was another opponent. We'll see how it turns out. That's the best we could do. Um, Pittsburgh was 12 and 6. It's a small town right on the Indiana border, southeast of the lake, out, right, right near the Indiana border, 12 and 6. Okay. We didn't know a thing about them, and they certainly didn't know anything about us because they were way out of the reporting area of our paper, which we relied on to see <laughs> what was going on. Um, it was like playing a group of wrestlers. Okay. Um, they probably didn't have a player over 6'1". The guy guarding me had to be on the wrestling team. I've never, in, my, in all the years I played in high school, four years, I've never been manhandled. I've never been elbowed deliberately. I mean, actual elbows. They resorted to, we don't match up, so let's just beat on them. Yeah. 
that that's what that's how the game started out. I've never experienced anything like that. But we kept our composure, seventy to forty four. Let's go home. So we <laughs> in the second half it yeah. was over. Um, so now it sets the stage. Look in the paper. Fenville's next. And and and, and I did see too. Also, Fenville uh, was ranked sixth in Class C in the state were, of Michigan. They were yeah in that regional. Incidentally, there were three ranked teams, which wow. you don't always see that. Constantine, which is the best team we ever played all year, six seven six 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 two plus front all state six seven guy, good team, nice guards. Then Fanville was ranked either fifth or sixth at the time. They kind of flip flopped. Sure, we were. I think we made it into number eight for sure. Okay, so we got three ranked teams. Um, you figure if all things go well, the, it's going to end up being two ranked teams facing each other. And so we had we had Fenville, and now we're into who is Rich, who's this Richie Jordan yeah, about, and how do you prep for that? Right, and 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 before we talk about the game, I, I do want to talk a little bit more about Richie Jordan and try to, you know, paint a picture of, of how incredible of an athlete he was. Um, a few things I know, and then you can fill in the blanks and add to it. But um, as you mentioned. He ended up averaging 44 points a game that year, which is still uh, MHSAA record. 44 points a game, again, without the three-point line. Um, he was only 5'7". Five, 5'7 five, seven, seven and a half. 5'7 and a half. 38-inch um, vertical. He could dunk at 5'7", five, 5'8", seven, five, five, seven um, He had over 2,200 career points. He was a uh, Scholastic Coach Magazine High School All-American first team, along with the great Lou Alcindor, also known as Kareem Abdul-Jabbar. That's so correct. Richie Jordan from Fenville, Michigan, right. was a first team All-American with Kareem Abdul-Jabbar. Right. Um, as far as I, I, I know at one point, and I think it's still the case, only Michigan athlete in the National High School Hall of Fame. Right. Definitely in the Michigan MHSAA Hall of Fame. And he wasn't just a great basketball player. He was an incredible football player, incredible baseball player. He had over 5,000 career rushing yards in football. Went on to, and, and I know you mentioned, I didn't even, he, he was a track star as well. He, he high jumped of all things. Yeah. Which, and he, when, I, when I had talked to him 50 years later, he said, yeah. I, I said, man, that looks pretty good. So they had it set up around six feet, so I went ahead and did a flop over it and I, or something like yeah. that. Something that you would say, how could that be? <laughs> yeah. And he just did it. Yeah. Yeah. A side story is he was he told he was lifting weights before it was fashionable. He was. And if you saw him in person, yep, yeah. you would you'd say, Yep, he's doing something. So uh he was ahead of his time as an athlete and also the training that he you know, and and then did go on to play football, basketball, and baseball at Michigan State. No, we'll, we'll, I'll, I'll describe that. Okay, if you okay. Want to know. Yeah, yeah, yeah. We 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 can get into that into that a little later. But as far as you know, from a basketball standpoint, what what else, what else, you know, what am I missing here? Too? Well, I mean, he led the nation in scoring. Unreal. Forty four a game, and this is the likes of guys like Pete Maravich and some of the the the, the sixties guys that went on to fame. You know, really, really good play. He led the nation. Um, again, 51-inch running vertical. So you could jam with two hands, and I'll tell you a little story on that if you want to yes. know. 38-inch uh, vertical standing, standing, which means at 5'7", he could, he could shoot over virtually anybody. In our game, he shot 51 times, and we got a piece of one. Wow. One shot. And we had a guy, as you saw in the pictures I showed you previously, that had five, six inches on him. He was a good defender, and it was like he wasn't even there. Um, I, I had, when, when I talked to him, he gave me a lot of, lot of statistics and little side stories. But as an athlete in football, I'd read the paper again. Yeah. Jordan scores five touchdowns and runs for 255 yards. And I go, oh, that's pretty good. And then I'm reading further. Said, And then in the second half, and I said, are you kidding me? I mean, it was Unreal. not uncommon to put up two hundred, rush for 200 yards yeah. and a half. Wow. Um, first time I saw him, well, maybe I'll just hold back on my description of what I, when I saw him in person for the first time, what I thought. But <laughs> we'll hold back on that. Okay. 
But um, as a basketball player, I mean, there's no comparison. I've never faced anybody like him. Um, so, okay, go ahead. What else? Yeah, okay. So, so going into this game, it's the regional semifinals. Yes. Um, you you had heard about him. You knew about him. Um, was there any sort of, uh, hey, here's how we're going to try to try It's the to only time him? all year. Yep. The only time out of 23 games we played that the coach actually had a different strategy than what we, we normally were. Play defense, rebound, run when you can, find the open man. Very basic. And we practice those things every day. So that was, you know, no, no, nothing special. Um, against Jordan, we didn't know it, but our coach, when he uh, kind of got a preview of how the regional might line up, thinking, if we can get by this district, here's what it looks like. And there was Fenville looming there. So, unbeknownst to us, he actually went to scout with one, okay. of, our, uh, uh, one of our teachers who was kind of our scout. They went together. I think it was the Kalamazoo against Hackett. And Richie put up 47 in one game with Hackett. The second game they had with Hackett was supposed to be at Fenville or vice versa. They had such a demand for tickets that they moved it to the Western Michigan Fieldhouse. So it must have been Hackett's home game. Okay. They couldn't accommodate the demand. So they moved it there. 8,000 people filled it up. I went to Western. I know what that, I played at Western in the quarters. Yeah. I know what five, or what eight, there's 8,000 people there. Wow. They filled it up. Richie struggles early, ends up putting up 49, 24 in the last quarter. Now think <laughs> about that. Just sit back, it's a 32 minute game, 5 7 guy. Hackett was no pushover. They, they, these were good teams. He puts up 49. Wow. Um, to give you a preview. So, so, the coach was at one of those games. We didn't know it. We went through after Pittsburgh. We won that game after getting beat up. We he yeah. the next day in practice he said we're gonna uh, a little bit lower intensity. We we'll do some shooting, some free throws, maybe run through the offense, but let's let's heal a little bit. Never said a word. We knew Fenville was next. We weren't. We didn't. We didn't think a thing of it. Be honest with you. We know okay. Jordan. Like this ought to be interesting how this yeah. turns out, but we didn't know what to expect. Um, we're done with practice. We're just about ready to go to the locker room. Coach says, everybody come around. I, get over here. Here's what we're going to do. He said, all season long, every team he plays doubles them for sure and sometimes triple teams them. Now, he said, if you see him play, he can beat a double team just off the dribble. I mean, he his ball handling skills were as good as his shooting skills. He's a very quick first step. He can shoot over anybody. You know, you can put two, two, you know, six, eight guys on him. He's probably going to get the shot off. Um, if he doesn't, he's making his forward an all-stater because he's dishing to a guy that nobody's covering. He said, you know what we're going to do? He said, they fail miserably. Double teams, triple teams fail miserably. Here's what we're going to do. We're going to do the opposite. We're going to put one man on him. Sophomore six one guard who probably filled his shorts when when the coach <laughs> said that to him. He's gonna he's gonna defend him. All I'm asking is this: make him work for his shot. Make him go to his left. Get in the line of the pass. You know, um, get a hand in his face every time he takes a shot. Whatever you can do to make sure he earns his points. Sure. And he said, the other part of this equation is we're gonna shut down his teammates. We're going to do the opposite of what everyone else does. We're going to shut them down and let them try to let him carry them through this. And I don't care if he gets above his average. It doesn't matter. We can win this by doing that. And that was our charter. So we go take a shower, get in our cars, go home, have dinner, and go, okay, we got this figured out. Um, And that was the strategy. It was basically don't don't double him, don't triple him. One man, do the best you can with him. And um, and actually, when the smoke settled, that's a, we ex, it doesn't often happen when a coach can have a really nice plan and gives it oh, to a high school team and say, yeah. this is going to do it for us. It's the execution part where it falls uh-huh. apart. Oh, yeah. It's one of the few times that the strategy and the execution work, and, it, and it worked. 
All right. So, so yeah, uh, take us through the game. All right. So we're 18 and two. Yep. They're 17 and two. We're on a 14 game at that time. 14. Yeah, we're on a 14 game winning streak. They haven't lost in a long time. They're averaging 90, um, setting the stage here. Um, and you guys were averaging 80. We were averaging so 80. We what, were, what an, I mean, it is. If you think about it, we're, we're talking high school here. Yeah. And, and the game back then, it's, even though it's 50 some years ago or more, um, it's no, it's really no different. Fundamentally, okay. it was the same game. If we took both of those teams and put them in today's environment, you wouldn't, it wouldn't, I mean, it would be the same. Okay. The rules were the same except for the three point. Right. And, and if you did that today, I have no idea how that would have turned out. <laughs> So here we got two ranked teams, <laughs> and I got to give you a little story of coming to the place. We leave school early because we're 80 miles from Battle Creek, so okay. we got a long drive. Ba which high school in Battle Creek Battle was Battle Creek Central. Central. It was okay. at the Battle Creek Central Field House, which I think might have been a, a shared. It was like a mini version of Chicago Stadium. It was the old iconic uh, building that took up about a city block okay it had its you know yeah. high ceiling and girders and stuff um you know it was it was quite quite the place to play we walk in and we were, we were from a town of 1500 people and we're coming in to us it was like holy christ this giant place we, we we pull up and there's no one there was a game going on the game before ours was, was going on it was probably in the third quarter by then and there was no one in the lobby or the ticket windows we're going you know are we in the right place <laughs> we look along the side and way in the, there's a line of people going all the way down the, the the length of the state of the arena and in the back there was a door open and you could see people oh. getting in. we're going okay i didn't think anything of it i just thought well, that's pretty strange yeah we get in and we basically went to the locker room right away because already they were ending the quarter and the fourth quarter was starting. We had to get dressed and do all that kind of stuff. So we never got a chance to scout the team that we might be playing if okay. we beat Fenville. So we didn't have any opportunity. So there's there. a game. The the the, it was the other double semifinal final game was going right. On. It was yeah. a double yeah. header. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, Constantine was wiping out Matawan. All right. I'm going to take a quick break, and then we'll be back with more of the Attack the Rack podcast. And welcome back to the Attack the Rack podcast. Real Estate Ryan has been in real estate for over 20 years and can help you with all your real estate needs. Real to Ryan has helped me in my journey in learning about real estate and he can do the same for you whether you're looking to buy, sell, or just learn more about real estate in general. Ring Real to Ryan. Um, so we go to the locker room, we get dressed, we get ready to come out, we get notice, all right, your time to warm up, boys. Well, we didn't know by then, the previous crowd switched with the new crowd coming in. Yeah. Because I don't think they're going to allow you to <laughs> take up seats when you got, and by then, Jordan was a celebrity of sorts. I found out when I was involved in the documentary on Jordan. I got to talk to the manager of the field house at the time. He was the AD at Battle Creek Central. And I think he was a basketball coach, but he also managed the facility for games. He said capacity was 2,800. Okay. For our game, there was 3,200. <laughs> he said the people found an open door. The janitor left the door open in the, in the back and someone discovered that. They didn't have tickets, and they slipped in. Yep. So we, we throw in another. He said it was the second largest crowd in the history of the, of the place, which has been there for like yeah. 100 years. You know, So that's the kind of crowd that was in there. We took the floor for our warm-ups. They had to make a path for us to get out of the locker room because people were lined up from the baseline under the basket yeah. all the way to the wall just standing there. Yeah. And um, so here I am going, you know. I, I, I walk out and I look around and I said, there is more people here than we have in our whole town. There's twice as many people. <laughs> yeah, yeah. What in the heck is going on? <laughs> the aisles were, there were no oh. aisles. So people were sitting in the aisles. People along the first row of bleachers along the sidelines, 
their feet were sticking out over onto the floor because they were so tight together they couldn't yeah. pull their feet back. And finally, I look up and there's students and people sitting on the the girders, the steel wow. girders, extending out over the ceiling, <laughs> over the over yeah. the court. And I'm going. I said, man, you best not screw up tonight because there are so many people here. You, I mean, I did. I really <laughs> told myself, you best keep your composure, take it all in, and you need you need to focus on on, on what's going to happen here. Yep. I mean, I had to tell myself that. I'm trying to be cool about it, you know, um, and try not to look around. The stadium or the arena had the, the seats were pretty fairly sh- steep. They just went up both walls, pretty mm-hmm. high to yep. get. 3,000 plus in there. So the sounds would basically come down onto the floor. They didn't, you know, yeah. directionally they come down. And, and there's a reason for mentioning that later. So we take the court. We're warming up trying to like, okay. You and know. and um, previously, what do you think was the biggest crowd you guys played I would in say b- the size of our schools were C schools, a couple of yeah. D's and the B's. I would say it would be a stretch to say we had 1,000 people. Okay. I think our gym might have held maybe 800. Okay. I'm just guessing. Yep. Uh, I think maybe in the district, because there were four teams there, it might have hit 1,000. But sure. that was in a big Class A gym. and uh, So it was by far the biggest crowd. Um, the fear was, are younger guys going to you know, start getting their shorts wrinkled here and looking around? And I always tried never to watch the other team warm up during – I always thought that was a sign of what are you afraid of while you're watching them? Just take, yeah, get yeah. your warm up, shoot your layups. Let's get going here. Yeah. So a couple guys started to glance over there. I go, we, we don't, we don't worry about that. So we take the floor. We're warming up. I'm in the corner taking shots, and it was right opposite the Fenville locker room door. Okay. But you couldn't see it. I didn't know it. All of a sudden, there, you know, security guys. Hey, make room, make room. Literally, make yeah. room, make a path. And I'm standing there, and all of a sudden, the crowd just goes nuts. And I know it wasn't because of us. <laughs> Here comes Jordan leading him, and he's got a ball under his arm, and he runs right towards me. And I took a look at him, and my first impression, honestly, was how would you tackle him in the open field? Okay. You could not, a high school kid could not bring him down. His thighs were, you know, big. And his wrists and forearms, he, he had a, he was, he was not heavy or chunky. He was just solid. Yep. And you could just tell that it was his legs were just, were, do, were taking care of his jumping for sure. And he brushed me as he went by. <laughs> and I thought, well, that's, that's good. Is that like, <laughs> what's that mean? <laughs> so they go about their business, shooting their layups. We're just about done. The horn's ready to blow. And I glanced up, which I always said, don't ever watch them. And and, it, and Richie had the last shot layup. And it was on a – they hid their right and left layup. Yep. And then they oh, were yeah. shoot going in, you know, straight. He goes he, – he, he goes down, dribbles the ball a couple of times. He goes up and jams it through hands. Oh, wow. So I'm standing there, and I looked at his feet. And yeah. his feet are – they're four feet – it's four feet off the ground. Uh, you know, I go, wow. How could that be? And he slipped it over two hands, and then he went, you know, and sat down. And I thought, this this is going to be a long after or a long <laughs> evening. Yeah, I mean, really, it was very impressive. So the loudspeaker comes on. Announcer says, the fire marshal is going to suspend the game until the aisles are cleared. People get off the off the girders. Wow. People under the basket find a seat. There was actually they put bleachers on the stage, which took about a hundred people out of the equation. And you know we're yeah, gonna wait. No one's moving. No one. No one moved. Oh my not, god. Not no one moved. No one listened. They they kids stayed up there. People. Nobody moved. I found out years later, being involved with the with the documentary, is the the manager of the venue said, "Listen, these people have come." 80, they got an 80-mile trip here. If we suspend this or delay the game and it doesn't start till 9, 9.30, we're going to get home at 1 in the morning here. These are kids. They got school buses. These are parents, jobs. Yeah. They can't do it. We right. can't. Fire marshal said it's a, it's a hazard. I mean, the exits, how do you get out of this place? 
they negotiated and the, and the manager said, we will, we will be fully responsible for ev- anything happens and we will be the first to react if there's a problem. Trust us, which he was just blowing smoke because yeah. the MHSAA was not going to say, okay, you can suspend the game and come back tomorrow. Right. Um, which, so, so that occurred. That was interesting. That is crazy. So then we go to the, right before the horn, we go to center court captains meet so it's me and richie and the refs <laughs> refs are going through there you know watch your feet along the sidelines there's a lot of people here here's how we're going to call it all the standard stuff right you know all that time richie's and i are facing each other well he's looking up you know i got like <laughs> six eight inches at him <laughs> and he's looking right past me he didn't look me in the eye he just looked right past me with a blank look on his face he, he never like didn't blink didn't acknowledge anything. They, they, you got any questions? He didn't say no or shake his head. He just, he said, he nothing. just said nothing. So I go, that's odd, you know. I didn't hear half of what they were saying. I was so wound up. But at least I, was, I could nod my head and stuff. And then we shook hands and off we went. Coach, get back to the huddle. Coach, is there anything I should know? And I said, yeah, I think Richie's full of himself. Oh. I said he did. Uh, that was my sure. initial impression. Yeah. It really was. I said, God, he didn't. He didn't acknowledge anything. It's like he's above all this, you know. Well, I was a hundred percent off on that, uh, but that was my impression. Tip At off. That time. Okay, so here we go. Tip off. We go up nine to nothing, just like that. Jordan misses four his first four shots. Now, when he put up a shot, it had distance, and that was those were long rebounds. We en- ended up going up 13-2. I thought to myself, for the only time during the game, we either got him on an off night or he's, he's overhyped here. Either one I'll take if it continues like this. As soon as I get that thought in my mind and run down the floor, four in a row. Bam, four possessions in, in probably two minutes. He, 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 he puts up four bangers. Straight up, boing, 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 thank you. And next thing you know, it's 25-24 to end the quarter. Okay. The thing is, Jordan scored 11 points in that first quarter, which is right on his average. Yep. He needed 11. He needed 13 points to break, or he needed 12 points to break the all-time single-season scoring record. In the state of Michigan. In the state of Michigan. Okay. MHA, wow. Yeah. Yep. In the state. Yep. And I believe all class. We're not talking. Sure. Yeah. Right. Oh, yeah, yeah. He needed 11 to tie it. He got the 11 in the first quarter. Now the, the, now the, the game is on. So he comes out in the second quarter, less than 10 seconds in. He comes down, crosses 10 second line, puts the ball on the floor maybe twice, maybe three times, goes straight up, launches a bomb. And I watched him because I was out on a wing guarding, defending my guy, but I opened up a bit so I could get a glimpse of him just to make sure I knew where he was. Right. I saw him go up. I saw our guy go up with him, who had five inches on him. Had his, he had, the defender had his hand right, right, right on the ball, just basically on the ball. Richie cradled it in one hand and just waited till that yeah. defender just started to come down. Flicked, he flicked his wrist. He didn't use his arms. He didn't throw the ball. He flicked his wrist in the ball that I thought was going to hit the ceiling. I mean, it was a long archer. Boom. And I thought, man, this is going to be quite the deal here. Yeah. I mean, it, and they stopped the game. Okay. Gave him the ball, him. announced he broke the record. He had 13. Now, no one in that place would imagine that he would put up 47 more yeah. by the time the, I mean, 47. This is a high school game. Yeah. When, and, and again, let's reiterate no three, no three point line. No three. I would say, it's not a stretch to say half of his shots, he shot 51 times. Half of them were from 20, 20 feet out. Yeah, yeah. I, 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 that's the thing that, it, that amazes me is the, the strength it takes. I mean, some of those shots were like nudging MB, N, NBA's territory. I'm not, I'm not exaggerating. Yeah. As, a, as a, an opponent, um, if you weren't able to answer as a team, just his scoring alone, you're done. Yeah. You had to answer. If you didn't answer for one or two possessions, you're going to be down four or six points pretty quickly. I mean, there were some times where he, he, would, he would put up, you know, in 30 seconds he'd score twice. If he turned the ball over or something, that's what it's like playing somebody like that. 
So they game the game, they game the ball, game resumes back and forth. So we're say, okay, this is going to be one of these kind of games. We got to answer. We just got to go back and forth. Well, they pressed the whole game right away, yep. right from the tip. And there was a point in that was a point in the game where we had a turnover or two because of the press. And against them, Jordan was rolling now. That's all he needed. You give them an opening, and before you know it, this is no exaggeration, in a matter of minutes, we were down 13. Wow. And he would come down on, on consecutive uh, possessions and bang. And if you went out, went out and crowded him, he's yeah. going to beat you to the he's going to yeah. beat you to the hole. Um, you give him room, he's going to kill you. You double him or squeeze him. He's got his guy over on the side there that he's going to look for. Um, you could you couldn't beat him really. I don't think he ever really was beaten in any way, shape, or form defensively. And we had a nice guy on him, and the kid was working his butt off. Yeah. And he played the entire game, and he, I'm sure he was a young guy, 15, 16, but I'm sure he was quite exhausted <laughs> following Richie around. So they go up by 13. Um, we managed to cut it to 10 by halftime. Okay. So we go in a locker room, and uh, not much. Was, coach didn't like, oh, man, nothing. Didn't really say anything. Hey, keep defending, you know, keep defending, run when you get a chance, uh, got a rebound. That's all he said. He didn't say, you're fine, you know, you'll be all right. None of that. He wasn't like that. Just matter of fact, just play the game. So we go back out. We cut it to five quickly. So we made up that five points at the beginning of the third. And um crowd's starting to pick up because we went down by 13. There's 1,500 people that are sitting there wondering how about to drive home. <laughs> and the other half is going crazy yeah. watching this performance that they're putting on. And so it was obvious that the uh, Fenville at that point was going, it ain't about how much, if we're going to win or not, it's about how many we're going to score and how many riches we're going to score. So we cut it to five. Again, the press bugaboo or turnovers or some ball handling errors, not bad, but there were some errors. They jump on that right away. He's, they, they scored like 14 points to our zero. We're down by 13 again for the second time. Wow. This time, there's two and a half minutes left in the third. Okay. So now we got 10 minutes to make up 13 points, hold them to nothing, and try to win. And it's the only time in the whole game, to be honest with you, that I was walking off co coach called timeout when we were down by 13. Fenville side was, man, they were yucking it up. You look over at our crowd and they're going, you know, you know we're 18 and 2, and we're going to be 18 and 3, it looks like. I thought to myself, you know, if we got to lose, Maybe it's best to lose against the best score in the history of the state. Maybe that's maybe that's how I can position this. Maybe it's better than losing by one in the last second. I don't know. And that entered my mind. We go in the huddle, and here we go. We go in the huddle, and I'm thinking, I was deflated. Yeah. But I still had my head up and say, we still got to play. We're not going to give up. What's Coach say? He said, listen, we're going to start to miss. Now, a coach is Catholic. I don't know if he offered up some prayer or something, but somehow he said they're going to start to miss. As soon as any Fenville player takes a shot, doesn't matter who it is, the guards, you release. I don't care if a forward takes a shot, whatever. Guards, release from your defensive positions. Release and sprint down court. Front line, this is your job. This is it. You need to haul in anything in your area code and instead of running a traditional fast break you know side middle charge um, i want you to get the ball wherever you land with it and turn and find the guard and hit him i don't care what method you <laughs> use to get the ball to him this way baseball pat whatever it takes like your quarterback hitting, <laughs> hitting exactly. a wide receiver downfield it, exactly <laughs> so we're going and i'm thinking Okay, it's a strategy. I didn't, no one questioned it. We didn't look at each other and go, what the hell is he talking about? It, it, we didn't. We just went out and you know what? <laughs> Very next play, Jordan comes and he misses it. And because of the distance he used to shoot from, that's a fairly long rebound. It clanks off pretty good. <laughs> our, our, our center grabs the ball about right in front of their basket and he turns and he throws a baseball pass to a guard. Who catches it? He caught it like a wide receiver. Yeah. Bam. 
He was already past the 10 second line. Okay. Catches it about at the top of the key, hits the ball down once, scores. Okay. Hmm. Well, that's good. That's a start. We would all fill the lane following that pass. So you had basically a four or five on one. We'd have the trade, we'd have a trailer, but everybody would fill a lane just in case it was a putback. And then we'd sprint back and get in the defensive spot. They come down again. Guess what? Missed. Same thing. Our, our other <laughs> forward grabs it and he outlets one, hits the guy on a dead run around the 10 second line, dribbles it in. They ain't putting anybody back. Yeah. They, they, they're going like, that's the part I didn't understand. So we do that. <laughs> in the course of two and a half minutes, we scored 10 points and we cut it to three. Yep. In two and a half minutes, they didn't score a point. So we're getting, our crowd is going crazy. And during that run, in my whole, all the games I played in high school, I have never experienced a roar. It was so loud that it was deafening. You couldn't hear anything. The, the roar of the, the crowd drowned out everything. Yeah. And it was like you were deaf. You couldn't, when you talk to a teammate, you couldn't hear each other, even if you were right next to each other. And that's how wild it got because we're, we're doing this. And we did it like five times in a row on five consecutive <laughs> shots. And the people were going, I can remember running down the sideline, filling a lane, and the people were moving their feet so I could run down. I had to look down, and it was just chaos. <laughs> so in the huddle, we're down three now going into the fourth. Well, okay. The problem there, as you know, you can lose momentum. It's all about momentum. So with that few, that little break in the yeah, three and periods, and, and and there's been a handful of runs now in this game. They guys been, started out on right. a run. When is it going to end? Right. And then they went up 13. You caught back up. They went on another run to go up 13. Now you've gone on a run. Right. So no, whose turn is it next? Exactly yeah. right. That's exactly right. And fortunately, we never thought that way. But that's the, the rational thinking would say they're in. They're going to have another one going here. So how, I mean, let's face it. You got the greatest scorer in the, in the state, and uh, he he could. He could wipe out, wipe out a lead in 30 seconds. I mean, there's no problem. That's not an exaggeration. So we come out, and what happens again? <laughs> the first shot they take, <laughs> we grab the ball. Now they had a guy down there. Okay. They put one guy down. Well, we so it turned out to be more, but still it was that quick outlet that was at minimum half court right away. Grab it and get it there within a second. Charge. Everybody fill a lane. We overwhelmed the defender, and he basically got out of the way, and our guy shot a layup. So now we're down one. By then, the crowd, you couldn't describe it. Yeah. I can't describe what that was like. I mean, your your chest was thumping because of the sound was so, you know, it was really something. That's a, one thing I'll never forget. So here we go. They had missed, at that point, eight, eight shots in a row. My coach is wherever he got his information from was right on. They take a shot. Now they put two guys back. All of us finally. Well, they missed again. He went with the break, outlet to the side, and then, you know, guard come across the middle. Always attack from the middle. Yep. We ended up with a not three on two, four on two, whatever it was. Um, guard pulled up at the free throw line, a little bit inside free throw line, and hit me in the corner. Dead corner. Bounce pass. I didn't. I didn't hesitate. I should have, but I did. <laughs> I went straight up. Bang. Thank you. That would have been a three pointer for sure. Okay. <laughs> Put us up, up by one. one. Yeah. After all of that, we we managed. We we scored fourteen unanswered. Now this is what makes the game kind of special from our standpoint. We were down twice, and we made up. You know, we went up with a fourteen zero run to go up by one. Now, the question, of course, is can you hold that? Right. We're facing Jordan, remember. By then, Richie got his rhythm back. He missed, he missed three shots in a row. They missed nine shots altogether. We hauled in seven of them and turned them into points. Now the game was, here we go. Now the game's on. Yep. We got one point separating it. Who's going to fold first? We went back and forth, and the way it turned out is Jordan and I started to trade baskets. 
I was freeing up and I was playing on in, instinct, not thinking. I'm, I'm free. I got a shot. I can make it. And I just, I just, that's it. I got fouled once, made a couple free throws, got, you know, it was yeah. not just going through what you do in basketball. Right. If you, you know, you re, instead of thinking, you just react and do mm-hmm. what you practice. So we went back and forth for a while. Um, and then we got a four point lead. Somehow we were up by four, but there was still five minutes to go in the quarter. Our senior forward, our rebounding, he had 19 rebounds when he fouled out with nine points. He would have easily got double figures. 19 boards. Wow. Fouled out. We replaced him with our six man. So we just lost about three inches. Okay. And we lost a, a, a junior six man lefty for a first team all conference guy. Right. That's a, that's pretty big. But our six man was a nice, steady player. He was good around the basket and he knew what he could do and what he could. Sure. So that was not too bad of a hit. But nonetheless, we're getting vulnerable now. Within two minutes, our center fouled out. Now he completely dominated the inside. I don't even know if his man scored. Wow. He had 22 rebounds and 13 points. Now, we lost our best jumper. We lost a lot of size. We lost points. We lost rebounds. we got to hold them off now. And who does the coach put in? Golly. we got seniors sitting there that had good minutes in the course of the season. In fact, one of the guys played in the game, got a few minutes in a relief role, certainly expecting one of them to get the call. He looks all the way down at the end of the bench and he calls in a guy named Ralph, Ralph Schmaltz. Ralph, take me, take me in for now. A JV call up. Oh. He's never played on the varsity. He has no varsity experience. He was, we brought him along in a tournament to reward him for a, a pretty nice JV season. And he understood that he wouldn't even take his warm up off the entire tournament, no matter how long we lasted. He just about I, I, I don't Can't know how imagine. He, he, his eyes were like, are you, you know, like, are you kidding me? <laughs> In retrospect, I asked coach, coach, what, what were you thinking on that? He said, well, here's what I thought. Our center was, was an athletic jumper guy. You know, he could dominate. This kid was maybe six feet at, at best. But next year he was a high jumping champ. In high school, the state, state okay. won the state. He was a bit raw as far as a player. He wasn't a finesse guy. He was slightly almost out of control at times. But he said, I needed an athlete in there. I needed somebody that could disrupt things and jump, maybe haul in some rebounds. Seniors are nice, but I needed, I just needed somebody that was more athletic. No, no disrespect to those guys, but that's what I thought I needed. So he sticks them in there. Now there's like four minutes to go. We're up by four. We've come back after all of this. <laughs> and uh, he, he, he gets the ball and he takes a shot. He's about eight feet from the basket. And he throws a line drive that clangs off the rim. <laughs> and, and it almost took his head off when it came back. Yeah. Fortunately, we had a man back and, got, and garnered it in. Okay. We didn't lose possession. I go up to him. I said, oh, Ralph, here's the deal. <laughs> If you get your hands on the ball, don't don't put it on the floor. Don't pass it. Stand there. I'll come and get it. Oh, you okay. Give it to me. Yeah. I'll take it from you. With, you don't have to do that. One of our guards came up to him and said, Ralph, think about the situation. Just relax. Calm down. You know, he said basically the same thing that I did. So within a minute or so, he gets a rebound. Got to put back. He put it back. He scored. (laughs) And his eyes, I mean, it was quite, I'll never forget it. Like, holy cow, what did I just do? (laughs) So now to press on here, we're holding a four point lead with uh, a senior forward, our sixth man, and a JV call up is our front line (laughs) against the greatest scorer in the state who was on a roll by then. With four minutes to go, Richie was in the 50s. Wow. 
He scored 60, um, and he was in the 50s, and he was lighting it up. So I didn't really think about the disadvantage. In retrospect, we were we were primed for the kill. There, he could make up four points, like I said, in 30 seconds. There's no doubt. All he had to do is put his mind to it, and he could just drove to the hoop and, and just about beat everybody. Um, but we managed to to hold them off and kept that four point margin. I couldn't. I mean, we worked yeah. our ass off on defense. Yeah, and we we would not let them get near the basket. And for some reason, uh, Jordan was scoring, but we'd come back and answer. That was the key to it. He'd score, we'd score. So that four point, four point. And then in the very last minute or so, um, it became a free throw contest. They tried to trap us in that last couple minutes. They were pinning our guards against the sideline. It was a nice, yeah. it was a nice design, nice yep. trap. Well, we, as us forwards, we would take our man deep and then come back to help. And we'd maybe set up some kind of a, a, a pick of sorts that the defender would run into if our guard tried to get out of the trap. Somehow we yeah. managed to beat it. Yep. We never really practiced it, but we just did it on instinct out there on the floor. And guards broke away a couple times and scored. We ended up getting in a con- uh, free throw contest in the last minute and we outscored them 9 to 3. Okay. Horn goes off 101 to 91. Unbelievable. And um, I was down at one end of the court and I'm standing there. Didn't I had no emotion. I didn't know what to say. Yeah. I couldn't hear anything. People are pouring out of the stand, just like when you watch some of yeah. these college games. It was oh, yeah. not unlike that, except, of course, the crowd's a lot smaller. And, 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 and I go, my God, what the heck just happened? Mitchie was able to, he got off right away. He was very disappointed, so they whisked him off. And I just stood there and watched all of this stuff. We went in the locker room, and it was, there was more people and players in the locker room. Dads, yeah. relatives. No girlfriends, of course, but <laughs> they're coming in the locker room. They all wanted to be part of this. Yeah. Like, man, oh, man. And it was it was steamy and dark in there. <laughs> I had a bloody nose. It was pouring <laughs> out. And for the first time in my life, in, in, in high school, my, my dad came into the locker room, which he never, he always stayed in there. Yep. He didn't ever get in the way of anything. He came in the locker room and shook my hand yeah. and then just left. I thought that's pretty. Oh yeah, I mean, I always remember that. Sure. When I'm standing in the shower, taking yeah. a shower, his nose is bleeding. He comes in and shakes my hand. <laughs> and uh, <laughs> on the way home, we're in a bus that goes 55 miles an hour, so we're going to be in that thing for a while on an 80 mile trip. Uh, no one said anything. Really? Yep. There was no. We just looked at each other. Most of us were still sweating. Yeah. And. Um, really nothing like, boy, we really, you know, we, we, as a team, we never did that. Yeah. When the game was over, we didn't really gloat over a win. Sure. We, we were just, that was just our personality as a team. It was very quiet on the ride back. Um, cause we were trying, I was trying to reconcile what the hell just went on. Yeah. I mean, it was 32 minutes of, well, it was more than 32 minutes, but it, yeah. it, the comebacks, Richie scored. We didn't know how many he had. We didn't know how many he scored. We didn't know how many we scored as right. individuals, which all we know is we had put up 101 as a team. Um, we got back late, 12, 30, 1 o'clock in the morning, thinking, it's gonna, you know, there's not going to be anybody there. There was. A lot of the, a lot of the people drove right to the school and waited wow. for us, which was really nice. Oh, yeah. That's I mean, awesome. small town, the hoops yeah. is everything on Friday nights. You right, know? right. Um, so that was kind of nice. That's awesome. I go home. My dad sit in the kitchen table. You know, he's just sitting there. Now he started work at five in the morning. So now we're talking. It's already one thirty or so. So he's got to get up. He used to get up at four, but he waited. Yeah. And uh, he told me. He said, "Here's how many you scored. Here's what you guys did." He said, "Man, that, you know." And then he went to bed. Yeah, yeah. But he waited for me. That's awesome. So, um, anyway, that's. <laughs> I don't know if you want me to describe what it was like to play, Richie. Maybe I just go yeah. into that real quickly. Yeah. Um, I use the word relentless. He was relentless. He could come down without any exaggeration, hit three, four, five shots in a row. He would never show any emotion. And that's why when I said he was arrogant, I was completely wrong. He was so focused on what he was going to do yeah. or how he was going to do it 
that that's what he was thinking about at the when yeah. we were talking as captains. Yeah. I mean, that that's that's how he played the entire game. And here's what I appreciate as a competitor: no chest thumping. Look at my muscles. Trash talk. Look at me. Nothing. Right. He could he could man, he, the four in a row he missed at the beginning of the game. You wouldn't even know it. The four in a row he made right after that. Same. Never. And as a competitor, he yeah. basically said, "It's my turn." Here's what I can do. I'll go on defense now. It's yours to. I mean, that's what it yeah. was. He, I, I appreciated that so much. He, he was uh, he was all business. Um, so in retrospect, so here we are. What the, if you look at the stats now. This is the final chapter here. If you look at the game statistically, why is it so special 50 some years later? Why is it so special? At the time, it broke the regional total combined points record 192 yeah. between the two teams the previous record wasn't was in the like 80s or so whatever it was um it shattered that record that's in a 32 minute game you always have to keep that in perspective richie scored 60 25 for 51 from the field 10 for 15 from the, from the line as i talked to him later a year ago, he said, who shoots 51 times in a game? You know, <laughs> he said, well, now, now I'll tell you what he, what he commented there. Um, so he broke, he broke that. He shattered the single uh, regional game record, which might still stand at this day, 60 in a regional. It broke that. The combined score broke the record, for, and it wasn't even close the next year. Um, actually, both teams scoring, they scored 91, we scored 101. The previous highest was 90 by a team in a regional, so we broke that. We set a new team record with 101. Um, we scored 45 points in 10 minutes. When you look at how unbelievable it, it, it is, in a way, uh, as quick as that clock goes, we scored 35 points in the last period. Um, shot 58 percent in the last quarter, and and outscored. We scored 59 in the second half. Which is a pretty nice pace. I mean, you double that, you're yeah. talking about 120 points. Um, incredible. It, it is. Absolutely but, incredible. Well, that's, you, you take that game and put it in today's game, and I think the reaction would be similar. Uh, like, holy cow. Well, yeah, yeah. I mean, I mean, and again, we, we brought this up too. You're, you guys are putting up 192 points with no three point line, number one. Um, you know, also, <laughs> That, 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 that's just so incredible and um you know in this day and age um you know everyone wants to compare eras and and, and it's um you know we, we, we on, on a previous episode with ryan Klingler, we were trying to talk about this is when lebron had just broken kareem's record and we're trying to discuss the mm-hmm. very popular especially in this day and age question who is better jordan Mm-hmm. Or LeBron, and we're, you know, one thing Ryan brought up is with, um, you know, Jordan brought up in the in the last dance uh, docu series about, you know, how it's it's really impossible to compare because you can't compare eras, mm-hmm. and I think there's this like, um, you know, almost universal thought at least that the game of basketball has changed so much since then, and, and certain aspects of it has especially with the three-point line. You know, one thing we I've talked about on previous episodes as well is just the amount of three-pointers that are taken. Um, you know, I, I did a, a, a short little video about the, the Pistons-Nuggets game from 1984, highest-scoring game in NBA history. There was four total three-pointers attempted <laughs> in that game. <laughs> total. And then just uh, a couple weeks ago, the second highest scoring game, randomly coincidental to me, just telling that story about the Pistons Nuggets game, second highest scoring game in NBA history. I think there was 86 three pointers attempted. Mm-hmm. So, in that aspect, the, the game has changed a little bit. But this this thought that the game has changed so much, and that the the players are more skilled in this day and age, I think hearing your story and thinking about how right now in this day and age in high school basketball, uh, scores are in the fifties. And I I don't know if that's, 
style of play or skill. We'll never know. Again, right. it's hard to, you know, you know, comparing errors, but just the fact that you guys put up 192 points. I mean, the skills, the skill sets that you guys must have had. Of, I'm, I'm, I'm sure you're finishing most layups and. Yeah, yeah, fundamentally, it, yeah, you're right, you're right. and 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 this day and age, you know that some of that stuff you don't you don't always see. And again, you know, you score fifty points in the game um, right now, and you got a good chance mm-hmm. of winning that game. Um, obviously, completely different. When, and you guys averaged eighty points a game, right? Just apps, and, and Fenwell averaged ninety points. 90. Uh, just a, a, incredible stuff. I mean, um, uh, amazing basketball, I'm sure. Yeah, I would contend that if you the, – the high school game hasn't changed as much as the college and pro. College is turning into a mini pro deal. Let's go one-on-one and let everybody stand and watch this guy until he shoots and the shot is blocked. You know, yep. uh, the fundamental – there's not a lot of – as many cutting and screening. And the roles are not real precise. The screens are – they don't hold the screen, you know. Yeah. All that. I just notice all that oh, stuff, yeah. Yeah. and it's trickled down to the high school game too a bit. But I contend if you took those two teams and put them in today's environment, that it would you could say better players. The game's changed, but it hasn't except right. for the three point line. Right. I've watched many, many high school games since then, and the talent pool, regardless of of class, is the same. It's about the same. The rules have changed a bit with sure. the three point. But for the most part, that we can't say, well, that was in that era. Because I say this this has transcended multiple eras. You show me a kid that put up 60. You show me two teams that almost hit 200 points. That's <laughs> not bad. doesn't matter when it happened. Right. It's not like, well, that was old-time basketball. It wasn't. The only difference was we all wore Chuck Taylor all canvas <laughs> all stars that weighed about two pounds a piece. Yeah, we wore we had knee socks and the shorts were shorter. <laughs> I mean, other than that, the game fundamentally is the, yeah. is this is the same. Yeah, and, and the only reason our, our skills we had different skills as a team, and you combine them, and it's just what you needed. You needed rebounding and defense and some scoring. Yeah. Um, so that's why I think it still stands the test of time. And being able to play against somebody like, like Jordan. Yeah. So. And, and back to Richie Jordan, too. You were a part of a documentary yes. about Richie Jordan. Um, I will, that documentary is on YouTube. I'm going to post the link to that documentary uh, in the description for this podcast. So uh, if anyone wants to watch that, you were a part of that. You uh, even had some on screen uh, time on, minutes. In, in the documentary. What's interesting is they taped. I had about two minutes to say something, and you, they, that, that was about 45 minutes of taping. <laughs> I was told by the director that for every every hour of tape, you might get one minute of wow. action. Wow. <laughs> they had, tw- uh, for the documentary, they had 12 hours of interviews with Richie. They went down to Florida okay. and got and got him talking. And you saw how much time they actually, I mean, he got airtime and, yeah. and so, but but it certainly wasn't twelve hours. No. It wasn't even twelve minutes. Right. Oh yeah. Um, yeah. So that's how that works. But I, yeah, that was a privilege too. Yeah. And that's a whole other story. How I got involved. Yeah. How did that come even come about? It, it was simply I worked at Herman Miller, and uh, a couple of my coworkers they knew about my hoops and all that kind of stuff, and they knew about Jordan. I told the story. One he came, one guy came to me one day. He said, "You know, in the Grand Rapids Press, there's an article by a guy from South Haven that's." planning a documentary on Jordan. And he said, anybody that's, he's soliciting uh, anyone that played against him or with him or knows him or has anything to do with him, give me a call. We'll, we'll, we'll consider uh, using your information or, you know, so, because we're trying to gather as much as we can. So I thought about it and said, well, you know what? What the heck, man? That was pretty special. Not a lot of players ever get the chance to do what we what we did and play against a guy like that so i called him yeah and and to to make one it just snowball sure he said let's meet over here at the coffee shop and drove up south haven we met for a couple hours let's meet again so almost monthly we were we, we met with the mhssa ron pesh is the historian we met with him he wrote a big story about jordan we got him involved 
I have the business plan for the documentary, the initial wow. cut. John Moy gave me that. I've always kept it. I don't know yeah. why. Yeah. And in fact, in this folder right here, there's the, the Jordan story was kind of the concept and sure. what they were going to. It was quite the experience. But it yeah. all happened because a friend of mine. And I think you said, uh, you, you well, first of all, you mentioned meeting you know, on a monthly basis. Yeah. I mean, so it sounds like this was, there was quite a, oh, it took a time me, frame. To, it took, it took, here's a, the problem, not the problem, the challenge for a documentary. He wanted to first set it up to be put on a, a ESPN 30, 30. Oh, 30. yeah, yeah. He said this would be perfect. Yeah, absolutely. And it was, but that meant it had to be focused on, on hoops and not too much more. Okay. This documentary ended up being as much about family and his upbringing the and community. his heritage yep. and the community. Sure. Sure. And basketball was kind of secondary, sure. which is fine. Because yep. yeah, when you get to know him, you understand how important his family was to him. So, um, so that's, how that, that's how that all happened. I've got material that, that it was actually how much it cost. You know, so that you wouldn't you, – you would, Fill your shorts if you knew how much it cost for an hour documentary wow. on PBS. Sure. I mean, we're talking hundreds of thousands of dollars. So he, over the time, he had to tone it down. Okay. Cut the time. He went to the uh, W. What, in Grand Valley, there's a PBS. WGVS. Yeah, w yeah. He got to know yeah. those people, and okay. they said, you know what? Your best bet is tone that down to a half hour, Okay. which really means about 27 minutes of airtime. So. And you can cover a lot in 27 minutes when there's no ads or anything. Sure. So that was his, he, he revised it. He tried to get funding locally from the Denville crowd and whoever else he could solicit. Got, got some backing, but just not enough. The other challenge was finding a director. Okay. And a video, videographer, whatever they sure. call him. You got to have somebody that's taping that stuff that knows what they're doing and a director. He found a lady in Chicago who was involved with the Hoop Dreams documentary. Oh, yes. And her, her husband uh, uh, created the background music and stuff. And they found a, and she found a guy that could do the taping. And she did some taping, too. And so then it finally got introduced to PBS. Um, eventually it got uh, – it was shown in the West Coast. It was shown in Grand Rapids, too. I remember watching it. Um, Richie told me that he would have preferred to have it more about hoops. Okay. And the director told me, they took me to Battle Creek and taped me, which was very emotional, like I told you. Yeah. I mean, just asked me questions as I was walking, and I got to meet, I got to meet the common, the radio guy that called the game for, okay. for Battle Creek. Okay. And he was interviewed. He's in the documentary. Sure. Yep. Um, it was, it was pretty, pretty informative. Um, so I, that was, that was, you know, that was a pretty nice opportunity to oh, do yeah. all that. Um, so anyway, that's how it turned out. Yep. They put it on the market. It's been out for several. You can get it. You can get it on, online. All you got to do is put in Jordanville and, yeah, yeah. and you yep. can show it. Yep. Yep. Um, and so that was my involvement there, which was really, yeah, really yeah. nice. Really yeah. nice. Yeah. I'm sure it's a lot of fun and obviously bad, bad, great memories. It, it did. It did. It did. You wouldn't think for an old yeah. fart walking around a court 50 years after he played could even remember <laughs> stuff, but. All I had to do was just stand on a certain spot yeah. and say, I know exactly what happened. Oh, that's here. awesome. That's like incredible. that shot in the documentary that yeah. I said, this yeah. is where he took it? Yep. That's the shot he took to break, to break the record. Okay. Okay. Um, it yeah. was like a mile and a half from the basket. And he, <laughs> he shoots. So, so all in all, there, that's, that's yeah. the story. Yeah. And, and, you know, the recap is, or the final word is, he went to Michigan State on a full ride. Uh, uh, with the advice of Pete Gent. Pete Gent was a uh, all-stater from Michigan. Okay. Uh, from Bangor, excuse me. Played football and basketball, all-state basketball. He went to Michigan State okay. and played basketball and led, led him in scoring a couple years. He went on to join the NFL as a wide receiver. He wrote North Dallas 40. He's an author. North Dallas, you familiar with North Dallas Fort? Uh, I'm not. It's no. a it's a fictional account of his days with the uh, Cowboys. Okay. John Don Meredith and all that crew. Yep. And he was a wide receiver, so he influenced Richie okay. to go to state. Sure. Richie told me, and so did John Moy, that Richie received he has a, literally a suitcase full of offers from almost every school in the country. Oh, I bet. 
and, and there they sat. And he said he didn't actually go through them because he knew he was going to state. Really? Okay. So he gets recruited to state, full ride, of course, for basketball. Yeah. He was hired, or not hired, he was recruited by an offensive-minded coach. Well, lo and behold, before Richie actually gets to state, this particular coach went somewhere else. Okay. He was replaced by the exact opposite, a defensive-minded coach. So Richie shows up. Nothing said. I went. I actually went from Western to, to Michigan State with a bunch of buddies to go watch him play in a freshman versus varsity. Yeah, and because look, back then you couldn't play yeah. as a freshman. Yes, freshmen were not eligible to play right. in their own team. They had their own team. Yeah, yeah. They didn't games. even have a league, but they yeah. they they put games together somehow. Yep. So here's Richie. Uh, the Genes- it was Jenison Fieldhouse mm-hmm. at the time. He puts up thirty against the varsity. And he played exactly the same as he always did. Yeah. He'd come down, find an open spot, go straight up and bang it. Okay, so he told me after the game, coach calls him in. And he's thinking, hey, this is good. Yeah. They're grooming me for a spot in the varsity here, you know. When time comes, he's going he's probably pretty pleased. Coach says, We don't want you to shoot. My offense uses the guards to be distributors. Everybody on this team can shoot. So you're basically you're nothing special because you can score. Everybody can score. We need ball distributors. We need defensive guys. And Richie, can you run that by me again? <laughs> he calls his dad and he said, I, I want out. Yeah. I'm leaving. Yeah, I'm leaving. And his dad said, well, Richie, we've never run away from anything. You never run away as a family. That's what I taught you. You don't run away from an experience just because it's not going quite your way. You stick it out. Okay. So he, he hitchhiked home, actually. He told me he hitchhiked from Lansing to Fenville. And his dad basically said, you know, took him back. So he talked him out of it. But that ended. He, I think he stayed with the freshman team, and that was it. Okay. He stopped, play, he stopped playing wow. basketball. He goes out for football as a walk-on, and he makes the freaking team as a safety. <laughs> okay. He goes out for baseball, and he makes the team. This is D1. Yes. This is from Fenville Big to Ten. D1. Yeah. D1. Pirates are interested in him. They give him a workout. That's how. It, that's what they thought of him. He yeah. batted 568 at Fenville. Now, yeah. now, obviously, that's Class C and – but nonetheless, yeah, 568 is 568. They thought enough of him. He's working in center field, takes a ball, fields it, goes overhand, and his shoulder went with the ball. Oh, no. He tore, like, around his rotator cuff. That was over with. Yeah. That, that ended the baseball deal. Okay. Back in those days, arthroscopic stuff was not really – it was going to be conventional surgery, open that shoulder up so he – that was the end of that. So it's funny how that whole career just went. Right. It didn't go anywhere. Yeah. If he would have went to like an MIAA school, holy cow. Yeah. I, I can't imagine. Well, uh, do you imagine? I mean, it's so different now with the transfer portal. Yes. You know, you wonder if, uh, you know, if. if oh, yeah. Was, he would have. You know, they would have been crawling all over have, each other to have him. Yeah. He could have went anywhere from there. Right. Yep, you're right. That didn't exist back then. Yeah. Once, you know, he signed and he was on a, honored his scholarship and I believe he graduated from state. He went on to move to Florida. And he owned a, a, a fitness uh, business, which if you saw him, you could see why. Um, and then he was a, a, a weight, the weight guy for a, a weight, what do you call it? Strength and conditioning coach? Strength, yes. Yeah. Yep. Yep. For a, a, a football, high school football team. Okay. I don't think he coached football. He was just their sure. conditioning coach. And uh, through that business and coaching, and that's that's where it all went. Okay. So wow. in these days, he when he called me, he said, I've got hip problems. I can't do what I want. He said, I'm gaining weight. Uh-huh. He said, I've always played. He said, like, I shoot every day in my life, you know, got pickup games in school. I go golfing. I can't do any of it. He, okay. he, he was very, very depressed. Okay. And his mother had a severe case of Alzheimer's. His family was extremely close. Okay. Extremely. Family. He was a Jewish. Kid. Yep. So he was picked on a lot. 
little Jewish kid in Fenville, of all places, you know, and uh, his family meant everything to him. So he moved his mother down to Florida and actually took care of her okay. until she passed away. It was pretty brutal. And um, so this is kind of a mixed, mixed story. But yeah, but he's, <laughs> I mean, he's a real deal. Well, and, and, and obviously you, you, uh, you mentioned, you know, when you talk to him, when you talk to him. So you have communicated with him you know, all these years later. Well, and I, I told you previously yeah. before you and I started talking here is uh, I had sent him a thank you email after the uh, um, documentary was, was put on the air. I thought, man, I owe him that. Working yeah. for him. You know, I'm just Mr. Retired Guy sitting here <laughs> watching detective stories on TV. Um, and I thanked him on behalf of myself and the team and uh, – I sent him a document that document document that we wrote as a team about our year, and said, "Here's what we think of you, and thanks a lot." And I didn't hear from him; but he never replied until five years later. <laughs> he discovered what email was. Oh, that's great! And he yeah. ends up calling me at yeah. home, yeah. out of the blue, and that was two hours. Yeah. And then he said, "When I come to Fenville, I have to get back once a year. I'll okay. give you a call." Well, yeah. I. It took five years to answer the email. It's probably five years before he showed yeah, up. Yeah. But uh, oh man, he's got true. quite a story. I, oh yeah, it's quite a story. Oh yeah, know, the things he's done and uh, incredible. Um, well, hey, <laughs> um, thank you so much for for coming on the program and telling your story and t- talking about the great Richie Jordan. Uh, again, from my childhood, I had always heard about him. So uh, this has been this has well, been awesome for me. There's just to, just to reemphasize his, what he was about athletically. There was a couple occasions in the game. This is just a postscript to all this. Yeah. Um, here we've got a front line that's the supreme front line in our conference, leading rebounders, all that kind of stuff. Shot goes up against Fenville. We block out. We've got all the lanes to the basket covered. Our, our center played around the rim a lot. Yeah. The ball bounced off the rim, went to the other side of me. So it went straight up in the air and off to the side. We're boxed out. We go up to get it. Our hands are close to the rim. Out of nowhere, this is out of nowhere, a hand flashed over one of our guy's shoulders. Up above, all three of us cradled the ball in one hand and tapped it back in. Oh, my goodness. That ball had to been. That's probably 11 feet off the the ground, off the floor. And he tapped it in. We didn't know who it was. I remember turning and went, "What? where the hell did that come from? And I look, and there's Richie running back. His defense (laughs) has got the little shit-eating grin on his face. (laughs) Stuff, that's the kind of stuff that that kid could do. Yeah, incredible. Uh, So, Um, and and you know what? Before we wrap up here, too, we should also uh, talk about how that season did end up for you guys. Oh, yeah, yeah. that was Again, that was the regional Semi-final Semi-final. where you knocked out Funville. Right. Two two days later, you know, the the tournament as it progresses, it moves along. It does not wait for you. Right. So with its schedule, you're going back to Battle Creek. So two days later, we go back to Battle Creek. We face Constantine. Now, they're they're 18 and 2 now. Best team we ever played. Man for man, if we... Pulled my teammates. We'd say they they were they were they were state champs. Fenville Richie said that they fully expected Fenville fully expected to win the state championship. Okay. And the biggest disappointment in his all the basketball th- that he did was losing to us and not being able to go to the sure. finals. Yeah. He said I'd give up my scoring title. I'd give up my average just for that championship. Any interview that you read about Richie, and there are many on the internet. Oh, yeah. He's been interviewed a lot. He will always, almost always mention the game <laughs> and the loss and how disappointing. Yeah. That's just a side story. Yeah. 18 and 2, Constantine, 6'7, 6'6, 6'2. All states, guy averaging 26. Coach, that's my, I'm defending him. So that, I thought, muscular, got a picture of him, tall, lanky guy. 26 a game, he's the real deal. Their center is uh, like a tight end. Our center was long and lanky. This kid was like, a t- he's a tight end. Their 6'2 guy was a football player. 
So he's on the other side. Two nice sized guards that were bigger than our guards. On paper, our first appearance is this. Yeah. This is not going to turn out <laughs> well. Make long story short, we uh, we out rebounded him. The front line, our front line, out rebounded them by wow. thirteen. Um, sixty to fifty three. Close game, grinding. Yeah. Ball control. De- defense and rebounding was the key. If you played defense, because around the basket, uh, it was played near the rim most of the time. Um, when you went up for a rebound, you had to go as high as you could because these guys could reach over you. So we played hard. We held them off. I don't think we ever fell behind. They got within one. And uh, we, we managed a couple scores near the end and pulled it out by seven. So we won the regional. Re- regional champions. Yeah. What we consider the, the best team we played. And there's, sure. no, there's no doubt they weren't. Okay. We go on to the quarters. Might as well, might as well state the final <laughs> chapter here. This uh, is that Western Michigan where the quarters West. were held. Yep. Yeah. Now there's now there there was about five five thousand or so wow. people. I mean it wasn't yeah. full house, but there was a lot of yeah, people there. Yeah. We played a team called Concord, which was from the Jackson area. Okay. Twenty they're twenty and two. Um and we're twenty and two. We're both twenty and two. You watch them warm up and you go, This is nothing special. We compared them to one of the lower tier teams in our league, size wise. I mean, they, they might have had a guy six six feet. Nothing special. The offense was vanilla. Um, nothing. Yeah. The only thing is they came from the Jackson area, 20 and 2, so they must have something going. For the first time in three months, we were flat. I, I You can't describe all the things that went wrong. Turnovers, putbacks. You know, there's a description in the St. Joe paper that I kept. Uh, the sports writer said we we had five putbacks in a row. None of them went in, and they wow. were from like one foot away. Sure, our center bounce was just terrible. Uh, a couple of our guys had terrible games scoring. And uh, you know the guards scored six between the two of them. And in the prior game, they scored thir- you know thirty six. Um, it we're just flat. Yeah. It just fell apart. We made one last effort in the fourth quarter. Got within six. But again, miscues, pass it. It was just flat. It was just yeah. terrible. Never happened to us all season. We were effective when every when all the pieces worked. You know, when we were distributing, rebounding, hitting the open guy. When all that worked, we were, we we probably would win. And that's and this was the first time in three months that yeah. it didn't. Now, was it the was it the travel? Was it beating two ranked teams? A shootout? Yeah. And a grinder back sure. to back. Was it? We'll say no. Let's just look at it realistically. They outplayed us. We stunk. That's all there is to say. And we left. The, it was so bad when we got home. Our, our coach was getting death threats. Oh my goodness! Like, what the hell were you thinking? <laughs> no, really. That's how oh serious that business was. They, his Unreal. wife had to like not. They couldn't answer the phone anymore because, like, you guys should have just wiped them out. Well, we didn't. Wow. So that's how it ended. Yeah. We're one game away from the finals. Well, they, you know, that just shows, though, you know, whether – I mean, it's similar in the NCAA tournament, the high school uh, state tournament. You know, I think in high school, depending on if you get a bye in districts or not, you got to win five, six straight mm-hmm. games. That is so hard to do. It is. Especially for 16, 17-year-old – Exactly. 18-year-old kids. Um you know, and, and one one off night, and it's over. You're you're exactly right. Yeah. That, you're exactly right. Uh, like we said before, the the tournament moves fast, and you're on the road, and you're playing, and you're going to play a couple of days later, and it doesn't stop, and uh, it doesn't allow for any real lapses in your performance because let's face it, high school basketball. What makes the tournament unique is somebody's going to somebody can knock off. Anybody yeah. at any time. Oh well, yeah. It yeah. just depends. And you're right, yeah. young kids. I mean, our guard's 15 years old. Yeah. Um, one of them is. Uh, you're right. You're right. The unpredictability is what makes it kind of unique. So yeah. So that's how it ended. Um, and here we sit. So yeah. Well, hey, speaking of ending, let's uh, uh, go on ahead and wrap wrap it up here again. I I appreciate so much you coming on. I appreciate your time. Incredible story. Um, but there is one way I like to end 
a program, all right, um, with a couple of questions. Um, now, again, uh, a lot of the times, I, 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 the first two, it has three questions. The first two questions are kind of, kind of on par with, with what the uh, the podcast was about. Obviously, this one was basketball. So my first two are basketball related. Last question, a little bit more, you know, related to something else, some other interest that you that you have. So, um, first question: Five favorite basketball players of all time, and as I always say, they don't have to be ever have even played in the NBA. Just five favorite basketball players of all time. Well, yeah, I went more with the NBA guys. Yep, I mean, and, and, and most do. So many choices. Yeah, yeah. Being from Chicago area, I had a uh, soft spot for DePaul with Ray Myers. When he, I mean, I used to follow them in Loyola, but we're going to throw that aside right okay. now. So I went with the pros. I go with Kareem. Okay. Sky Hook, unstoppable. Held the scoring record until just a month right. or so ago. Right. Wilt Chamberlain. Uh, I'm dating myself, of course. Um, best center, the strongest center I've ever seen. Scored 100 points in one game. Right. Not uncommon for him to put up 50 night after night, 30 rebounds. I mean, off the Unreal. charts. Against yeah. the best there was. Yep. Bill Russell. Part of uh, 10 NBA titles. The only guy, the only center that I ever saw that neutralized Chamberlain, that played him. Head to head, and and it was a draw. Never yep. saw it at six ten. Sure, Chamberlain seven one seven two. Okay, Larry Bird, um, Mr. Consistent. One of the clutch time. Give it to Larry. I enjoyed watching him from the time he was what Indiana State or where? Yeah, well, he, he, he I think he he initially went to Indiana. And, and only lasted a couple months on campus, and then and then well, he, transferred into Indiana State. If yeah. you ever heard yeah. him talk, you know he wasn't yeah. going to be an academic all star. But, right. but right. <laughs> I mean, I, I, he's a good player. Yep. MJ, of course, yeah. best closer I've ever seen. Right. You put the game in his hands, and the end of the fourth, yes. and he'll close it. Yep. He did it for six six titles. A, a, exactly, and and not to get into the the, the uh, classic LeBron versus Jordan debate, but that's. That's one of the reasons that I put Jordan over. I, I do over LeBron. When you mention LeBron, yeah. that's yeah. One, I'm telling you, I, I follow being from Chicago. Yeah, I followed the the Bulls and watched their games. Um, he would close. He almost never disappointed you to close a game out. Right, right. Um, and, and LeBron is really good, but he doesn't have that same track record with closing he, things out. One hundred percent. And Jordan wasn't hitting, throwing threes up as soon as he came, you know. Yeah. Yeah. So it was, exactly. But anyway, I do throw a bonus guy, John Havlicek. Okay. Um, he was my fave because okay. he uh, defense and offense not spectacular. Um, he was just great. Part of eight titles, eight yeah. NBA titles, defensive player of the year several times, many times All Star, uh, blue collar guy. Yep. Uh, all of these guys are in the Hall of Fame. Right. So, yep. All right. So there you go. Awesome. Um, next question. Uh, five favorite basketball movies. Yep. Well, here we go. Um, Hoosiers. Oh, yeah. I mean, you got to, you almost have to have yeah. that in there. Yep. White man can't jump. Yep. I mean, <laughs> uh, semi pro had to throw comedy yeah. in there. That yes. is so bizarre and funny. Uh huh. With a little bit of hoops in there. <laughs> There's a there's a movie called One on One. Okay. Robbie Benson, who is was a young actor, it was about a uh, a stud from um, Colorado, small school in Colorado. It's a you know it's a fictitious type thing. What was recruited to play at a big university in California? Um, came with a chip on his shoulder. Didn't care much about the academic side. The story is about his struggles. Um, he, he thought he was hot stuff on the court. Mm -hmm. He wasn't used to a coach's structure and say, here's what we do. Yep. And he fought that. And the whole story is kind of a rocky thing. He fought all that. You know, he finally got it in his mind that, oh, maybe he's right. And yeah. it ended well. Okay. Like in the final game, he scored the winning basket. It's that's pretty, It's a nice little movie. Yeah, yeah. And then there's Hoop Dreams. Oh. I mean, that. Yeah. that's reality right there. Yeah. That'll show you what. Playing for a 
travel team or AEW yeah. ain't necessarily going to get you yeah. a look with the big time. Right. I mean, that's that's an eye opener. That was I well, thought that I was pretty good. Yeah. yeah. Um, and recently, I've come across the Arthur A. G. and William Gates, the two the two um, guys in Hoop Dreams. They have a podcast. See, uh, and it's it's phenomenal. Um, they they have a lot of really great guests, and it seems like so many of them are from that yeah, era. So, yeah, you know, they've yeah. had uh, you know recently I listened to one with uh, a couple of the former Fab Five members. They had Ray Jackson on an episode, Jawan Howard on an episode. Well, so right in that era, era. Uh, so it's a really good. Really and good their coach Pig 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 yeah. Yeah. He, he's a legend. Yep. He, he, he's produced so many. I think Isaiah Thomas you might did. have been one of his you products. Sure. Yeah, yeah. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. That was yeah. They, well, they, that that they, is yeah. well done. That won yeah. a lot of awards. Yeah, it did. So rightly so. Yep. Um, all right. Last question. We'll get you out of here. Uh, five. Uh, so I also know you're you're a baseball player. I'm a baseball fact, guy. When I was young, growing up with Mike, that was more of the connection I had with 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 you. Uh, I, I didn't know at that time about your history in basketball. I just knew he was the you know, little league coach and you know, just yeah. baseball, baseball, baseball. So I would love to know your five favorite baseball yeah. players. In the league. Just to back up in baseball, you know, I, I played through little league. All, I, I was a uh, star on a varsity for four years as a shortstop. Wow. And there's a reason why when I mentioned these guys. That I, <laughs> um, in fact, I coached uh, kids baseball in Rockford, Illinois. And then when we moved here, we started the Little League program, Dave Zesson. Yeah, yeah, I, yeah, yeah, yeah. We yeah. started that sure, yeah. and yep. uh, just kept moving on until yeah. I had to hand Mike over to the high school, and then that's <laughs> when it all ended. Uh, baseball, guys, these are all – now, this is going to date me, and it's kind of – some people might not even re- know these people, but yeah. they're all Hall of Famers. Being from Chicago, Nellie Fox and Louis Aparicio. Now, I don't okay. know if you know either one. I recognized the name Nellie Fox, but I couldn't have told you that he was a cut or – He's a white – Chicago Sox. White Sox. I couldn't have told you that. Yeah. I couldn't tell you what position. No. Hall of Fame, second base. Okay. Uh, lifetime 300 hitter. Um, his strikeout to at-bat ratio was like 500 at-bats. 13 strikeouts wow. for a season. Incredible. Louis Aparicio was a shortstop, and they were the combo. Yeah. The two of them took the White Sox to the World Series against the Dodgers in 1959. Okay. I modeled myself as a little kid in Chicago after Louis. Okay. He was number 11. All through Little League, high school point, I had to have number 11. Sure. Nelly used to use a thick-handled bottle-shaped bat and choke way up on He was a place hitter. Yep. Contact, bam, 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 all over the field. I use that bat even in the high school. <laughs> so there's their influence on me. Sure. Um, Brooks Robinson, yep. uh, best third base glove guy that I think I've ever seen. Um, he could change games with some of the people. But he hit for uh, power, hit for yep. average. Hall of Famer. And then Mr. Cub Ernie Banks. I had the privilege of sitting behind him at a Bulls game just by pure chance. Really? Him and Billy <laughs> Williams. Okay, yep, yep. And I got to talk. I probably spent most of the game talking to yeah. nicest gentleman, uh, ambassador awesome. of the team, Hall of Famer. I think he hit at least 500 homers. Played when the Cubs were in the bottom. Okay. But he always kept up his uh, enthusiasm. He's the guy that coined the phrase, let's play Let's two. Oh, you yeah. know, yeah. nice gentleman. And yeah. finally, and a lot of people might not remember this, Ted Williams. Um, last player that I know of that hit over 400. Yeah. On a season, he played 19 seasons his entire career with Boston. Yep, left-handed hitter. Um, on the final day, when he hit over 400, he had a choice of sitting and not jeopardizing his average. He was just a hair over four, like 401 okay. or two, and he chose to play in the final game. And he wow. got a couple hits and actually padded it. Wow! So the best left, incredible. Best left-hander. You know Billy Williams, oh, yeah. left from the left side. Yeah, nice swing. Ted Williams was – so those are my choices. Awesome. Awesome. Well, I love But, again, it. there's so many to choose from. Yeah. Yeah, definitely. Yeah. Well, hey, again, thank you so much for, for joining us. Fine. Um, I can I can go on and on and on, um, and maybe that's a key that we got to get you back on another one. Yeah, I don't know. Um, <laughs> I got any more stories. <laughs> but, uh, no, thank you so much. Okay. You're welcome. Please subscribe to the Attack the Rack YouTube channel and hit the notification bell so you are updated every time we post. 
Also, please like, comment, and share.